Okay, it says it's recording. Ron. Hello and welcome to Title Track Skill Swap. What an amazing, beautiful day sitting out here in the sun thinking about um, caring for each other and getting through these super, super, super overwhelming, um, emotionally draining and um, also uplifting. It's like, it's feeling for me a lot like this sort of manic place of like the highs and lows and really big dips, right? Because the gorgeousness of um, everyone coming together is really, um, is really showing incredible promise. And um, I'm here welcoming you um, to this particular panel about mutual aid. And we have um, some visionaries. We have some um, visionary, uh, um, May is here, May Beal is here with us. She is like an activator and an actualizer of process and systems, as well as just this juicy mind for, um, for being here together for the benefit of all. And Holly Bird, oh, Holly, so good to see you um, actualizing support and, um, and care for people in her community and region. And we have Angela Gallegos, is that how I pronounce it? Gallegos? Gallegos. Gallegos, thank you. Um, thank you also creating um, support and, and connection for people in her community. And then as well, Piper Carter is here with us. And, um, and we are going to dig in to some, of, um, to some of the visions, ideas, and actualizations of what's coming out of this incredible call for all of us to come together and look at what is really not only what we can do, but really starting and basing on um, what is needed, right? And so if we are coming together to find out what it is and really asking what each other is in need of, um, the ability to support is, is beautiful. And as a student of Buddhism, I, um, I, I thrive, I, 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 we talk a lot about um, sharing the merit and um, it's a blessing and a gift and a, um, a special, it's like, it's, like, it's like the glistening juice of why we're here. The beauty of to be able to give something to someone and open their heart in a way that feels held is actually generating merit. And so this, this conversation about mutual aid is giving us the opportunity to um, support a new paradigm shift in um, philanthropy, yeah? So this idea of um, benchmarks, accolades, and um, sort of commodifying the conversation around gifting is dissolving before our very eyes. And so I'd love to hear um, some of these dissolvers of the old paradigms introduce yourselves and share with us what, what's happening for you and your communities. I'm so excited to hear. And I just want to start, uh, Seth sent a question in, He's sending me questions via text. And I just want to start with his first question because it's just going to lead into this conversation. It's from Brad Kick. And the panel the question is about the future of mutual aid. Where can we take it from here? What systems can be transformed using a mutual aid process? Um, and so uh, this is, um, and, and also, what do you wish people who are jumping into mutual aid for the first time, what do you wish they knew? So I'm, I'm putting those forward as we step into introductions, because I already know that this is what you're thinking, this is what you're doing, this is what you're actualizing now. So I just wanted to throw those questions in for your introductions. I'm super psyched to hear what's happening in, in your communities. Let's start. I'm going, I'm going to go with who I see on the screen. Um, and, I, and I'm going to step in and I see Angela. So Angela, let, let's start with you and then you can pass it to who, um, who you feel to pass it to, who you see next. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, this 
I, I feel really good to be a part of this. Um, I'm like right now I'm on the West Coast and it's very early in the morning, but this is like a really great way to be awake and be in gratitude and space and share space and with everyone that's going to be watching this. Um, I'm from Southwest Detroit. I'll be back in a week. And um, that's where I was doing the mutual aid work along with Piper Carter. Um, we're from the Southwest Care Group. And um, I just want, and I'll keep it real short, but I just think that, you know, to answer part of the question is, um, for me, mutual aid is is about really caring about the whole of the person um, and the people who are in need. Um, it's very different from like nonprofit work and things that I've been exposed to before, um, in, you know, before any of this, because it's person to person connection and it's very heartfelt. And um, I think just that energy and that spirit of like really caring about people when they're going through this kind of time or anything like a low period in time i think it's where we can help each other and bring in um a higher energy and it's energy work it's it's really it's it's love it's power and and it's strong and i'll just keep it short there and 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 we'll keep it moving and um i'll pass it to holly honey everybody it's so good to see all of you um it's great to be here. I'm, I'm also honored and, and happy to be here. I'm in Northern Michigan, grew up in Detroit though. So I'm just, you know, loving you guys over here and actually Southwest Detroit was my area. And um, so I'm here in Northern Michigan, Traverse City, and um, I'm working primarily on indigenous mutual aid efforts, um, but also within my local community. Um, we, uh, uh, I organized through, um, you know, just the, the sort of the regular routes. One thing I think people forget about mutual aid is that it's not really like an organization itself. It's more so a collection of caring and committed individuals who are, um, are sharing goods and services, you know, to make sure that everybody's taken care of. And so like, as we're in this time of COVID and um, oppression, <laughs> I'm going to say oppression for everybody because we're all under the same administration right now. Um, and, and the unrest um, that our, our communities are, are feeling and facing. And um, there's so many aspects of mutual aid uh, and, and to mutual aid that, that we provide. So, you know, whether in, uh, for, for all of us, there's um, concerns about health care, um, protective equipment for COVID, um, food toiletries, medicines. And, and then I don't want to at all underscore the importance um, that we, we sometimes overlook because we're kind of thinking about the material things. But, you know, we, ha we also have to look at housing and funding for people. Um, sometimes people's car breaks down and they can't get to work or get to the store. Um, and then there's, there's the connection. You know, there's the emotional and mental um, health and love that we provide to one another. So like, I have countless friends, for example, that are involved in the protests all over the nation. Um, whether I knew them from before as water protectors or um, just in general. And you know, everybody's in a, in a state of outrage and in a state of, of um, sadness. Um, and just, and then motivation, like how do, where do, I, what do I do with this? How do I help, you know? So, some of it's also providing for that, whether it's just listening um, or saying, hey, you know what, I'm proud of you. Or, you know, you may have never have thought about this aspect of what this means before as a, as a baby boomer. And I'm really proud of the work that you're doing, you know? So there's, there's just so much to it. And um, I'm, I'm working with a network of people, at least for indigenous mutual aid across the United States. Um, there's many of us. Um, that have been working together just to provide help where we can. And, um, you know, everywhere, one of my, my main partners is in LA, um, another is in South Dakota, there's, you know, people in New Mexico and Arizona, um, and then on the East Coast. So there's, um, there's a wide network there for me. And then just as a local community member, um, I love the community I live in, I'm very proud of it. And um, everybody here is motivated, like, 
enormously to to do what we can. We're we're almost all doing okay, you know. Like uh, I think because of that. Um, so whether it's like working with the Victory Gardens, um, Penny and I, of course, we're on <laughs> weekly phone calls when I can get to it, you know, and um, or working with Title Track to to you know do demonstrations and an creating anti-oppression trainings. There's just um, so many ways people can pitch in and help. So I'm excited to be here. I'm happy to to hear what everybody has to say. Amiguich. Love you all. I'm passing. Okay, I'm going to pass to, let's see. I'm going to pass to Piper because I see her lovely face here and I haven't gotten to talk to her for a while, so I really want to hear her voice. Miigwech. Peace, everyone. Um, Piper, she, her pronouns. I live in Detroit City. I am a member of many organizations. I do environmental justice mostly and what I would call or, uh, cultural organizing. Um, I am a member of Southwest Cares along with Angela and um let me see well some of the things that uh we had talked about or been pontificating or struggling with are this idea of self-determination and you know it's a fine line with the mutual aid because when we talk about mutual aid we're talking about community care and folks caring for one another at the same time what we don't want to do is create something that makes our government you know able to slip out of accountability or being able to, uh, to be accountable to people who pay taxes um and so that's a conversation that you know i just wanted to bring forth um things that we that we have been doing um also too uh, the conversation about sustainability because um you know indigenous people black people people of color poor folks have literally been doing mutual aid that's our way that's our culture and so me personally i never even heard of mutual aid at the the term until this covid crisis and one of my white comrades was asking me about mutual aid and I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And then when she like said it to me, I thought like, oh, we've been doing that. <laughs> I didn't know that's what it's called. That's, that's mm -hmm. what, you know, but um, something to think about sustainability wise is, so, you know, where does money come from? Where do resources come from? You know, um, in this moment, you know, people are getting or not getting stimulus checks, you know, um, people, uh, there's a lot of people who were cut out of stimulus money, you know, um, there are folks who have been either self-employed or uh, in the gig economy or, you know, just are no income and who are left out of any of the compensation that's going on and has been going on and have con and have consistently been left out whenever there's any sort of uh support for anyone and so with that the mutual aid and the way that we've done it with southwest cares it was very emergent and what i mean by that is um folks came together and literally just figured out how this was going to get done. Angela, Angela is a big proponent of why we were uh, as successful as we, we have been. And by successful, I feel like we've been able to help a lot of people. We have a, a great working system. Um, we have a lot of people folding into the process that want to continue to support and um that that's a lot of thinking through details creating systems and so when we talk about things like you know dismantling this system which we often talk about 
and changing these systems, um, what are we moving to? Mutual aid is a part of that conversation as to like what we're going to move towards, you know, how we're going to take care of one another. Um, I think a couple of other things I'll be really brief to think about is just maintaining the idea that we're not heroes. We're not really doing anything so special. We're doing what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take care of one another. We've been gifted this time on this planet, and it's our duty to take care of this planet and one another. So um, when folks, you know, in this modern world that we live in, there's, you know, there has been lots of selfishness and self-centeredness, and the mutual aid community uh, and, and, and process is an opportunity to folks to step into a more communal collective way of being and way of thinking in the world and how to think of others. Um, how are we taking care of undocumented folks? How are we taking care of folks who won't be taken care of by the existing system? And what are the systems that we can create to take care of one another? And then what does taking care of one another mean? For us, it's meant getting folks some food. It's meant getting folks some money to pay some bills. It's meant um, checking on one another and helping each other understand more. But um, I think moving in the future, and this is my last point, I think uh, one of the most important things of mutual aid that needs to be a part of the conversation with regards to sustainability is how do we support one another in being powerful? How do we support folks who feel powerless and helping support them in being powerful? How do we step, help folks step into their own power so that we don't become another system that's just like a form of welfare? Because it's not about just get handing out things. It's about helping us all become stronger so that we can be more self-sufficient. And how do we create a, 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 a sufficient su su sustaining system so that all of us can be taken care of? And how do we bring more folks into that so that they can see themselves also as being powerful in that moment and able to support others. So just wanted to kind of um, bring a lot of those points forward. Um, I hope I answered uh, your question. Thank you. So um, if I'm passing it, let's see. I wonder, is everyone on here on the panel? Let me see. Uh, did I we see hear Penny. Yeah, Penny. Are you with us, Penny? Hey, everybody. I'm with you. Can you hear me? No, we're having a hard time. Um, I, you got, okay, great. Um, I'm shifting around here a lot, so I want to uh, explain myself. I'm at, at um, uh, our CSA cooperative production farm, um, kind of blending a couple of things. and. I have two baby bluebirds or blue jays over here that I have to feed every 15 minutes, but I felt I had to wiggle too much. My name is Penny Creeple, and I live in Traverse City. And um, the first part of March, uh, I traveled down to see my my mom, my 85 year old mom downstate in Central Michigan, and um, the COVID kind of expanded, exploded here. So I was at a distance, and, and in answering the question as far as um, how I got involved or where this mutual aid network started um, for me up in the northern region of Michigan, um, it came, you know, of definitely needing to reach out to people. I was concerned about people staying healthy and staying well, and one another. So uh, we right away started a small group of us, Spread Kick and uh, Lucy Wachter Webb, who was in an anti oppression uh, workshop with me at the time. We started a Facebook group and it just like boomed up to like 2,000 people, um, which is social networking, but it, it was all of a sudden relative to us to, to try to figure out how to organize this in our community in the Northwest Michigan region. Um, it 
it, it, uh, it started forming in that way through a social network, and then we created, uh, based on some help from an example through the Chicago Mutual Day uh, spreadsheet, and then we labored our way through um, putting that spreadsheet together a couple of times, which reached out to people both as um, folks that wanted to step forward and help, um, as in offer help to people through our community in one way or another, um, to also having a need request form. And then met May, um, who came on board, and now one of the biggest projects that we're doing is uh, focusing with her on how to keep um, that network growing and creating an app, which I think she's going to talk about, for people to connect. Um, so that's kind of like a little brief thing. I really um, love the fact that, that uh, Piper just said, you know, like one of the biggest things is that, you know, like we keep hearing this, okay, what's the new norm going to be like? And I don't even really want to say those words because it feels too, I don't know, simplified or something. Um, but I definitely see this as a permaculturist, um, an educator, and a, a person that facilitates and mentors learning about the way that we are living on the earth and not just our human community but the rest of the, the environment as well where we're living. I feel like this is an incredible leverage point for us, not just the um, pandemic but also the fact that um, so many of my friends in Minneapolis are dealing um, directly, directly with the need to build stronger community and offer mutual aid there. So I feel like it's a great leverage point for us and we're a little challenged here in Northwest Michigan because it's a place where lots of people have second homes and a lot of people um, consider this to be a vacation spot and so um, now that the, the first part of the issue um, was with uh, coronavirus has sort of come to a pass, now as a community we're struggling through how we operate. And so again, that you know new normal thing kind of comes in, where you know please let's not forget about this ability for us to make these system changes and looking at how like Carter said, how do we support each other and those that are have been powerless for so long and make sure that they're thriving. So our group is a very small organizational group. We're still struggling to figure out how to organize ourselves. We're not like a larger, um, uh, we have beautiful diversity up here, but we, we're not a large um, community right here in Grand Traverse County proper. Um, and so there's some different organizational things to look at. And I really feel like um, all of the people that have been stepping forward to provide food, um, financial means to help shelter people, um, all of these small efforts together have, have been incredible and are filling me with hope and wanting to go on, you know, to continue on with this work. So really looking at um, reaching out for more education, um, learning the language of what our mutual aid network can look like and become, um, which means that we need to share and educate. And so Highlander Center has been a place for us to turn to and get support as far as that goes. Um, really looking at uh, the dialogue, listening, sharing, and teaching through conversations, what we can do in that way, so that part of education, and uh, working towards, you know, building our neighborhoods and uh, smaller portions of our community into um, supportive pods where we are sharing our resources. Um, so that's kind of like where we're at right now. I, I feel people can get involved with us by connecting um, through our Mutual Aid of Northwest Michigan Facebook group, and they can also contact directly um, with us through gtmutualaid at gmail.com. I'm glad to be here with everyone and learning by doing. So thank you for your support. May, I think I'm passing it back to you. Yep, thanks.
Hi, people that are here and that'll be here soon. Um, my name is May Beal, and I have been involved in um, nonprofits and higher ed for 25 years in various capacities from um, being the just a regular volunteer to directing volunteer programs of many thousands of people to being in executive leadership and um, strategizing how to shape organizations and do change management and things like that. Um, I bailed on a bunch of that after I kept thinking of better and better tech um, to support that work because generally wherever I've worked has been um, underfunded and understaffed. And so how do we coordinate thousands of people um, in the few hours in the day that we can stay awake for? Um, so I became more and more technical and eventually I, I quit um, this state job I had at the University of North Carolina um, School of Public Health where I worked for many years um, to become a programmer. And so that I could just build the things that I kept trying to get other people to think about or do and um, get the computers doing things computers are good at and get the humans doing the human things rather than sitting there with lots of spreadsheets and administrative work that um, could be automated um, to just allow people to um, do things like mutual aid, like connect and dream and strategize and, and build. Um, that's what we need all of our humans to do more of. Um, so when COVID started, um, I started seeing pretty quickly a whole bunch of spreadsheets um, and Google Forms being shared. Uh, and it was really beautiful, like all the mutual aid groups, seeing what the other mutual aid groups were doing. Um, and I reached out to several that I have connections to. Um, because what I saw was um, these public facing, uh, easily downloadable lists of people's name, phone number, address, cash app, identities, specific um, issues they're facing this moment. Um, there's some really vulnerable stuff being shared, which is so beautiful, like uh, having people share with each other the realness um, is something we need to do more of. But I don't know that it needs to be an easily downloadable spreadsheet available. Like I could see stuff in LA, um, any, anywhere I was. Um, so I started programming <laughs> that day and looking at old code bases that I had and seeing how quickly can we try to solve this. Um, and I'm a part of a, a group of programmers that write software for free, um, largely coordinated through Ruby for Good. And several other people were interested also in um, how can we help. Um, and so instead of just writing software, which is what most software developers or anybody with any skill would start to do is how about I just use my skill now. Um, we really tried to network with people doing the work and figure out what are their problems and what are um, you know the ways in which those humans who are volunteering right then, what skill sets do they have? What makes sense to them? So rather than just build anything um, that we think might work, we um, redirected uh, to take the cues from the people. Um, so anyway, that's how I got connected into mutual aid and um, an aspect was in, in protecting people um, because in these moments but but always there's um you know opportunity for uh people to be preyed upon um especially in a cultural system that is set up to make people be in need um so the mutual aid sort of theories or some of the the way in which it's set up is to not see individuals as um you know, needy or uh, according to the bootstrap, pick you up by the bootstrap people. Um, 
that it's personal failure if you're in a, a situation where you could use some support. It's instead um, really looking at the structures that created that and, and working to build new structures. So I really liked Piper, how you were talking about, you know, what are we gonna build and, and how are we gonna recreate how we as um, Americans work and operate with each other. And the other thing is, um, Piper brought this up too, uh, a classic um, phrase of mutual aid is solidarity, not charity. So it's all about bringing people in together um, to contribute what they have to contribute. And, um, you know, similar to like, if you need something done, ask a busy person. Like if you need something, ask someone who has been there. <laughs> like four people share with each other and, and have always been doing that because that's the only way to make it um, when you are in a, um, group of disenfranchised people. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, I started connecting with, um, Penny mentioned the group in Northwest Michigan, which is Antrim County and Grand Traverse County, um, Ithaca, New York, Lansing, Michigan. I've been working with that group for a while now. Um, and Phoenix, uh, as well as people in Chicago, and uh, I've talked to Angela too about perhaps coordinating um, with Detroit, which would be great. So uh, myself and several other people have written some software to be able to facilitate exchange. Um, so it's kind of got a Craigslist feel um, in a way, but um, the other thing is it's not on Google's servers. <laughs> like um, the companies that we're using this free software from is uh, they're known privacy offenders and, and uh, privacy divulgers to uh, different uh, bodies that ask for that information. And you can read up, I encourage everybody to read up on what the Google privacy settings are and especially after the um, Patriot Act and now with um, Antifa being declared as um, a terrorist organization. So that means anyone that's against fascism. I don't know that uh, even if a company wanted to withhold that information that the government can now have. So um, I, Penny, feel a, a peer with you because I think of myself as a, a permaculture tech specialist and like how do we make our tech homegrown and um, keep our data ours and um, empower ourselves to um, be in network, network with each other. And um, everybody sort of touched on this. It's not just about people in need or um, adding some charity into a community mix, but instead building um, resilient networks. And um, with our ever-growing racial um, divides, we need to find more opportunity to bring people in community with each other in ways that are um, mutually reinforcing because um, the siloed approach to life or organizational development or community management um, doesn't work. So we, we need to find ways to come together and um, know each other better um, and not allow uh, the politics of the day to further separate us, but instead find ways to come together. So as um, devastating as um, COVID and the disproportionate impact on communities of color has been and, and being aware of and more aware um, than I was before of people starving and homeless, um, we just need to find ways to, to solve for those problems in our, in our communities better. Um, mm -hmm. I feel that. Yeah. I feel that big time. Um, and I'm sorry to step in in this moment, but I have to, I actually have to step away. And so I'm going to pass the mic, my, the moderator mic, haha, as if this conversation needs to be moderated in any way. Um, and I'm just going to leave you with a few thoughts before I step out. How does everybody feel about that? My phone is literally burning up and it's about to shut down. Like it's doing, it's giving me the, the I'm gonna shut down warnings. Um, 
I want to say thank everyone. I just want to thank every one of you for every single bit of energy that you're putting in, in all of the ways, be it building the systems, visioning this, the, the new paradigms. I came into this conversation um, because the last couple of years, this has been what's on my mind. And it wasn't called mutual aid in my mind. It was just called, how do we keep the movement builders and the light workers alive while I was watching everyone burn out? definite um uh burnout burnout from the nonprofit industrial complex primarily um i was seeing women of color people of color people of little means and people who were stepping up in ways that were above and beyond their capacity and i started to look at this imbalance between the capacity of the people who were holding the weight to keep these systems moving and these people who would stop me daily and say i wish i could help and then back away with guilt these were chiropractors, dentists, um, artists, business owners, land owners. I mean, it was everyone. And I wanted to be able to say, uh, go give a massage to my person who's writing the injunction to stop the pipeline in your backyard. What happens if you... And so I started to see this tapestry that was its own social network with very strong um, security culture conversation at the very beginning that really was... Um, self-directed, self-driven, and a place where people were invited to spend some time recognizing their capacity and how far we push it, also recognizing the importance of letting go of a gift when you give it versus uh, expecting to uh, be acknowledged for or what have you. And so this, the, the idea was to create a pool that was not about me to say to you whether you needed to meet a bar to reach from into it, right? And there was, you know, systems around that. And that's how I met May was sharing with her these ideas. And somewhere is sitting a little beginning concept of this, the, the pre-coding um, that if somebody, you know, if there was the money or the energy, I see like a really wide scope vision that actually teaches people how to, it supports people in learning how to keep these conversations going because the communities are here, they're happening. And the people who are holding people together and holding each other up and falling off the side of the cliff, most of those people are like doing something for a community because as, um, as uh, Piper said earlier, like this is what we do, this is who we are. We are tribal by nature because we have, because this is who we are. It's how we live is we don't have, there's no question about taking care of everyone in our, in our circle and how do we widen that circle. And so I'm really, really interested in, in um, design around um, this conversation of mutual aid because when COVID hit, I was like, you guys, we could have, we, like, you know, I saw the possibility for in this one, you know, big dream platform, every single one of us to be able to work together where we were able to share specifically within our zip code or our close community in tight little groups or mutually you know share the remote work and the options that we have and we'd be so surprised we need land we need space we need the mic we need billboard space we need you know health care wellness i mean go on we, we know what we need so how do we bring this in together into a place that allows cross-pollination between not only our tiny groups, but like the, the fact that we're all interconnected. I mean, when you say you're working, I'm going, I, we know that we're supporting each other's family through this because we are already doing that. And so that comes for me very strongly right now is, is how do we bring these together into a place where, no, we're not trying to grow into millions and billions, but we certainly know, um, we know who in our community needs help right and so the more we come together in these places where we are cross-pollinating and supporting um in that learning process of how to actually take care of each other from a non-western framework a non-settler colonialist framework of like i will give to you i see a lot of these mutual aid platforms where people have to go in and say i need diapers for my baby like i don't want to see that i want to see us being stopped to where someone can come and go shopping versus someone come and say, can I please have, please, sir, may I have another, right? Which is what we're all saying. We, we're not comfortable in that paradigm. So I'm working in my mind and heart and 
would love to see community come together around a real conversation around like the whole the holistic way of looking at this not just how do we feed the poor and hungry but like how do we stay moving together as this system this organism of like you know energy generation and change making and so that's where my mind keeps coming in and Seth hasn't sent me any more questions um, and and I have to go because I just got another one and I can feel how hot my phone is it's literally burning and I'm gonna pass it to Holly because that's who I see right here may I add one one thing first Holly yes absolutely thank you Rachel um, Angela, you were a, a good panelist and answered the question, but um, a lot of us talked about all kinds of other things, and I didn't know if you had anything else to add because we, we did a lot of ad-libbing. <laughs> I mean, I think, well, Piper and I, we worked really close together for the Southwest Care Collective, and um, I think uh, in general, it's just like quick introduction, you know, just touched on a few things, but when she came on after, she really shared the spirit of like how we felt about doing this work, and um, I was just like going through my notes uh, from when I started. I had this big book, and it's not your normal notebook, but this is what I was using in the beginning, and this is actually a book where I would write like, um, you know, during that time, the, big, the, the end of March, I would write um, like, you know, I was trying to go in, into myself and like, you know, like I said, you know, just do work that could make me feel a little bit better. But at my heart was saying, you know, I got to help and as much as possible. So this notebook has so many notes of, um, that those brainstorm calls that we had to, you know, get everything together. And, and our collective is, it, it started off with just five people and then it grew to almost 20 people. And it just, um, you know, talks to the spirit of the community coming together. We did our zip code, our, it was a like Southwest Detroit for, it was probably like five different zip codes that we touched uh, or more really. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I'll, I'll just leave it there. I'm I'm really interested in in hearing what everyone's saying and kind of um, you know sharing and from one another. But yeah, that's pretty much I'll say. <laughs> Thanks, Holly. Hope that was okay. Oh, absolutely. Yes, I'm I'm so glad you did that. And um, I guess I'm um, I'm hoping to know. And, and maybe maybe you could direct me what do you think would be a great thing to like go on from here what do you think would be really helpful for me to discuss um well i think one thing that has is a, a thread that has gotten brought up is where are we at now so we hit the initial thrust of um the need created by COVID and um the structures of our communities that were not prepared to help in that moment and like Penny was saying, to really leverage this moment toward um, building new systems and um, webs of interconnectivity. Uh, I think this thing about the future and anybody who um, is not yet involved in mutual aid and, and maybe wants to be, um, what do you see, I guess, as the future? I, I don't know if everybody agrees that might be something that we could talk about next. That sounds great, May, and, and thank you for framing that. I think that that will be really helpful for our listeners to sort of know where we're going with the conversation, and I, so I appreciate that. Um, so where do we go with mutual aid? Um, again, we all know we have these needs, and, and so much of us have very similar needs. Um, some of the, you know, there are differences in that. Um, I know that, for example, the Black community, the Latino community, and certainly our Native community is is usually um, suffering, you know, greater disparities in care and, and um, infection rates, et cetera. Um, and, and that's something that, um, you know, we all, we all need to kind of recognize and work with too. Um, 
which is why I love hearing my sisters here say, you know, we've always been doing this. This is how we are. And, and, and I agree with that completely when I've known Penny for like what, 20 years. <laughs> so we've been, I mean, we've been doing different parts of this at different times in our community. And, um, and now hearing everybody else who's kind of been doing the same stuff, it's, um, I think we do, we do fall into that sometimes, uh, you know, that strength, but also that um, wormhole of being one of a few people in any given area that do a lot of work. And um, so I appreciate this, this format and this connection that we're, that we're making right now, because sometimes the helpers need help too. And sometimes the helpers just need to know somebody else is there listening, right? So this is, this is really great. Um, but to answer your question, you know, where, where do we go from here? And I think that um, the, the best source of, of where do we go from here, the best way to look at that question is to, to look at the needs of the people that we work with. Um, of course, you know, being a, a water protector and an, uh, an indigenous activist, um, I, I look forward to um, doing everything that we do with an eye towards working with our earth, you know, making sure that um, we're keeping things as green as possible, that we're, that we're um, encouraging a shift away from fossil fuels, um, that any of the work that we do follows those guidelines as much as possible. You know, if, if um, we're feeding people, let's try to feed them organically. You know, if we're, if we're creating victory gardens, let's make sure that we're doing that in a good and healthy way for our environment. Um, when we're, when we're shipping, um, shipping things, you know, let's, let's do that um, with the least amount of uh, devastation to our earth as possible, you know, and, and I think it, ultimately when you do that, um, the people that we help get the most healthy benefit from that. So, um, because often they are the, the populations that, that are subject to all those things. You know, everybody um, that, for example, in Navajo Nation right now, and even my people, San Felipe, where we have very similar infection rates, it's really, really high. And, um, because of the, the lack of access to health care, to water, to running water, et cetera, et cetera, um, those things fall disproportionately. So if we're doing things in a really green and healthy way, then they get the benefit of that. That's helping to make up um, what they weren't getting before that led us to these crises. So um, that's something that I, I really want to stress as much as possible is, is to keep those things very healthy and and that goes for you know our people out in rural native america as well as our urban folk you know there's it happens everywhere um <coughs> or whether you're even in a in a traverse city rural population you know we have um people here that that live um in situations where it's difficult to get uh, to have access to really good food um, or to, to really um, healthy products. Um, I have a friend who is a, a native um, mem tribal member up in Canada, and he's in Northern Canada, and they have no access to fresh vegetables at all. Like they basically live on meat, you know, and that's, that part of that's unique to that environment. But you know, of course, the first thing I say is, oh, why don't you guys plant a garden? You know, and he goes, well, we could, but a, a season for us is like two months. So, you know, we can do greens. And so you go, okay, how do we brainstorm around that? Because obviously there's, there's gonna be a problem with nutrients, right? For these populations that are, that are needing things like that. And when, I, and when I bring that up, I also bring that up to people around us. I mean, people in the city may not have um, the ability to grow on a long-term basis. People in the Northern states or even the Southern states where it's too hot, they may not have the ability to, to care for a garden with water. <clears throat> so how do, what do we do? And this is where we get creative, right? And we, we reach out to our friends that are innovative and um, people like May who are making like enormous strides in technology just to help this, this wheel um, run a little smoother and better. Um, 
you know, how do we how do we do it, uh, an inexpensive but healthy pop up greenhouse for an Arctic region? <laughs> you know, how do we do that so that people can eat? Um, so that's the kind of thing that I look at and, and what I'm looking forward to. And I, I think we have an enormous opportunity for that, actually. So it's sort of like um, everybody remembers like Heifer International and some of those organizations that were helping people in Africa um, during droughts and during famines and helping to, to buy them farm animals or equipment so that they could feed themselves and make, you know, some kind of money to bring into their households. And whether you, you liked those organizations or what they were doing um, at that time, that was, you know, some creative thinking, right? Um, those were things that were, some people benefited from. And, and now we're moving away from that even, you know, and, and making newer, um, probably healthier ways of doing things. I, I had spoken recently to um, uh, Jeremy um, Carter, who is the son, grandson of President Carter. And he, um, he through their foundation, they had actually, in uh, Africa, they had found that there was a huge incidence of people in these rural areas without clean water that were suffering from a, a worm infestation. And these were, it, it's something like the stuff out of nightmares, but the worms would be these like super long worms that would get into your body and cause a lot of problems they were different than tapeworms. And the, the most simple solution to that was actually being able to somehow filter their water. And um, the, so they kind of worked with them on that. And, and in order to do that though, you had to go in and like, like really understand that community. So this is kind of getting back to listening to the needs of the people you're working with. You had to, they had to get into that community, really live there and listen to see what was possible. Cause they could have given them all the equipment in the world and it, and it might not have been sustainable, right? So, um, and they ended up being able to devise um, a filter system that they could make out of local materials that they could use forever. And they basically eradicated that infestation in these communities just by that, you know, it's, it started with like using a pair of nylons over a hose, you know, but then figuring out, okay, if this is working, how do we do something like this and accommodate it here for this population? So that's, and then in a green way too. So, because you had to do this in a sustainable green way. So um, those are the kind of ideas that float through my head. And that's where I would like to see us going as, um, as mutual aid people. Um, keeping all of that in mind and keeping uh, a look toward the future, especially with our changing economies, especially with our, um, our uh, un political unrest, you know, the future is kind of interesting, but hopefully we can make it um, caring and beautiful. Thank you. And I'll pass to, let's see, Penny. We can't hear you, Penny. Holly. Um, those are great ideas. While you talking, the thing I think of in my normal design mind was the um, familiar uh, structure or press look at songs and move out from you know, zero to you know, around your home. Hey, Penny. Um, I think your signal is yeah. struggling. Penny, if you want to write something, I'm happy to read it. Can you hear me now without my video? Yep. Okay. Can you hear me without my video on? Yep. yep. All right. I might be able to do it this way. Um, so uh, I was thinking in terms of zone, um, you know, permaculture zones of 
of designing out, you know, and like, and also connecting to the idea of um, where we go next, you know, it really does take certain amount of sincere commitment to organizational structure and um, design when it comes to keeping this kind of work going. And, and because like already I see in my community, people walking around without masks on, people, um, you know, like not, it just like I, it's almost like it was a dream you know the last three months um and and we're and what's opened up is even more and more and more of a need for us to do this kind of work together so um for me i i still stay pretty close to zone one you know i still my work and my interest is really trying to be as impactful as i can in my neighborhood and in my community and creating models that sometimes in the mutual aid world are called pods. Um, so we're not necessarily looking at the whole community, but we're looking at um, those people that we know um, personally that we already have a relationship with or that we can build a relationship with. So starting out in that small way where we're working with people and then with the intention of expanding out and reaching more and more. And I feel personally, um, I don't know if Holly would uh, agree with me or not, and she may, but I feel like we have so much work to do right here in our um, very privileged, mostly white community in Traverse City. We do have cultural diversity here. We do have a lot of different um, uh, levels of class as far as people with and people without. There are so many people that have lost jobs because as a tourist place and for two or three months they were out of war and now they have to come back in. So there's all kinds of complications um, in regards to those right here in our neighborhood, in our community. So what I would like to see is more um, what I'm to a community farm and the CSA farmers and gardeners is approaching what Holly was talking about as far as, as food security, but doing it on a neighborhood basis. You know, like there's so much education that has to go into how to grow a plant, you know, and how to grow your own food. And I realize that nature doesn't hurry and that human beings are even slower sometimes. But, you know, like if we all were at least, you know, beginning a stronger, um, more devoted path towards educating ourselves about our food supply right here at home, um, that that would be so helpful. So, for instance, um, Poesis Community Farm and my OKCSA cooperative put together, well, got cut short because of the pandemic. We couldn't um, hold our seed shares like we usually do. So I said, dang it, I'm just going to put a table out in front of my house on 2nd Street. People are already used to seeing me down there at 5 and 2nd Street. That's really me. Um, putting out there and, and hand, you know, giving plants and food out during the growing season. But we got to give seeds out because all of a sudden the stores, you know, were not open and people were freaking out. You know, like, where we, can we get our seeds and when are we going to be able to get this and that? So. Uh, Jamie and Brennan and I set up a seed chair right out front of my place. And I think over the course of about, um, for the numbers people, uh, about maybe three or four weeks, we gave out at least 400 seed packages. And then I went straight into, with their help um, on the side, um, handing out seedling shares and so we grew the farmers and the people that are, are growers here and interested in growing just in one way or another and it was it was not like totally organized it was just like okay I got these can I put them out at your house I'm driving by and so we've now we've given out probably close to 300 plants and the remaining plants that aren't going in the ground in our short growing season up here are going down to Detroit to the community gardens down there where they have a longer growing system. So, you know, like that might sound soft and not as crisis oriented of a mutual aid design as some are, but, you know, if everybody does something, you know, and we keep contributing and sharing with people and letting people know that that's what we're doing, 
um, and communicating and setting up dialogue and reaching out, it's just going to get stronger and stronger. And I just love living this way. And I, in, you know, encourage and invite people to just, you know, when when these kinds of crises happen, you know, like what's going to hold you up? You're going to think about this came from my friend Aaron Sharkey in Minneapolis, who's right in the epicenter of so much with George Floyd's death. Their community is coming together like it's just amazing what what they're doing. I might start crying thinking about it. But she said, you know, like what's uplifting her is you you see the people that are helping, and then you start helping. And so the word help sometimes gets like a bad like rap. But you know we uh, we get we should have to keep leaning in and, and it's just so beautiful when when things fall apart that we can be there for one another. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for inviting me in. I'll pass it on to Piper. Thank you. I um. I got so entrenched in listening that I need you to repeat the question. Um, where do you see the, the future of mutual aid going um, and or ways for people to get involved or what, what we should be focusing on going forward? Something like that. But anything you want to say is totally legit. I think in terms of uh, getting involved, there's a lot of different mutual aid uh, networks that I've seen across the country. Um, we, I can send a bunch of links, uh, through for, you know, for folks to follow up, but I know, um, in Detroit, Michigan, there's one, and that's the Southwest cares is the actual mutual aid network here in Detroit, but there's a Michigan mutual aid network um, there's a black mutual aid network that, um, stems out of Chicago. Folks have sent me a list of mutual aid. I have an actual Google doc. That's a mutual aid network of, uh, I'm not going to say all, but it's at least one mutual aid network in each of the 50 states as well as in Brazil and the various countries around the world. And also um, there's a plethora of them, you know, in, in, in many cities um, across the States. So, and I know there's uh, like a Flint mutual aid that I've seen. So there's many, many of them and I'll make sure to send you that spreadsheet to send back out to folks for doing a follow-up. That's if you want to get involved in specifically in the existing like mutual aid networks. I think um, sometimes we think of activism as being this thing that's like we read about and it becomes very romantic. You know, I grew up in the movement. My grandfather was a Garveyite, which means he followed Marcus Garvey. My grandmother was in the church. She is one of one of the founding members of that church, they um, got together and purchased that church in 1955. So it's been paid for, you know, a black community paid for the building in 1955. They did a lot of work here and in Africa since the 50s. Um, and not just the like, you know, trying to make everyone a Christian, but actual you know, connections with folks and actual partnerships where folks would come here and, and people would go there and do exchanges, exchanges of culture, exchanges of resources. And I think, um, you know, just for me personally, I never thought of myself as an activist because the activists that I knew were, you know, my badass family members who were going to you know, to jail or dying and things like that. So when I first got my, my first like official training, if you will, in the industry, <laughs> it was in um, 2011. 
and it was at Chicago Freedom School. And it, I was preparing with a group to uh, begin a youth program that we created. And we did this youth training where adult facilitators that were going to be working with young people went through training like adultism training and, you know, just uh, uh, anti-oppression training and all these different forms of anti-oppression. And I remember being in that training and the trainer was a white person, very radical. And they were using all these big words and I really didn't understand what they were talking about, honestly. But by the time we got to the end of the training and they asked for feedback, I had asked for if they had a more simplified version so, you know, I could understand everything. And what was interesting was the trainer told me, oh, I didn't realize that you didn't understand because you were completely, you know, involved in the conversation the whole time. And it kind of clicked when I got back to Detroit, like that, you know, we look at activism as being so sexy or, like I said, romantic, you know, and it's like, we had leaders, you know, like Ella Baker, you know, we had leaders, you know, who got a lot of press and they dressed really well and they spoke really well. And it's very difficult, you know, for just a regular old person to be like, you know, how am I supposed to tackle white supremacy and capitalism? And that's the foundation of this country. You know, and it's easy for a person to be like, you know, what can I do? I can't do that. There's nothing I can do. Yet and still, like I said, we each are connected to entire networks of people that are doing things all the time. Granted, the facts are some of this stuff takes money and some of this stuff does take a lot of money. And the facts are that things have been off balance for so long and it's an imbalance of power, it's an imbalance of resources and being involved in a mutual aid in this kind of way, in this very intentional kind of way, number one, it allows folks with resources to step in and understand what they could do with their resources and understand hopefully in your mutual aid network, you're having conversations about white supremacy, privilege, uh, anti-capitalism, um, because what we don't want to do is recreate an imbalance of power or recreate a system where some folks that have resources get to have this level of power that they're doing charity for folks and can just do this and feel good about themselves and then go away and be like, oh yeah, I help these people. And so I'm doing something for the movement. Um, That's not what we want to (laughs) do. What we do want to do is have everyone be really thinking about what are the ways in which we can actually redistribute power and redistribute wealth, you know, and, and in real time. And, Mutual aid is a short-term solution. We need to be also thinking about what are longer-term solutions. Some longer-term solutions that we have in Detroit, um, we have a, through We the People of Detroit, which is an org that is a part of our ecosphere, as is, is asking us to put forth a water affordability plan. Now, there are lots of... Um, folks that are throwing down on this water affordability plan. But one of the resources in Michigan that we are blessed with as a great as a part of the Great Lakes region is one of the freshest bodies of water in the world. Yet and still many Michiganders are currently living without access to fresh water. Surrounded by it, it reminds me of that story. I think is it um, the albatross, when he said, it's a poem, and he says, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink, when they're stuck on the on that boat. And it makes me think of Michigan. It makes me think of Flint, 
who's currently, as of four years now, an entire city living on bottled water. And if you think of what that means in terms of resources and resource allocation and how Flint even got there. Flint got there because there was an emergency manager that was put in place to bottom line everything and advise the governor to make a decision to switch from the fresh, clean, pure Detroit River to the toxic, nasty, disgusting <laughs> uh, 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 Flint River. Did I say that correctly? From the fresh, clean Detroit River to the very nasty, toxic Flint River. And despite what scientists had said, despite what experts had said, despite the fact that it had been shut down for 50 years and had been named toxic for 50 years, and what did they do? They poisoned an entire city. People died, children were brain damaged, and that's permanent, right? You can't reverse brain damage. And people who were living with existing conditions were worsened, you know? And so um, what we must do, I mean, that was a government, right? That was a government that did that to people. While the governor, as you know, is one of the main uh, benefactors of this company called Nestle that pays $200 a year to uh, bottle the freshest water on the earth that we said, which is from the Great Lakes, and then sell it back to people, okay? And the reason that I'm mentioning that is because I said at the beginning that what we don't want is for mutual aid to then become this thing where government is not accountable to people. So while we have these conversations about how we're taking care of people, I'm a member of Frontline Detroit. You know, we're, we're powering, uh, you know, we're in the streets powering, delivering water to people because 10,000 people in the city of Detroit are currently living without water because they've done water shutoffs. And the reason I'm mentioning these things is because while we're talking about this system that we're redoing, we have to look at all of these systems and how these systems are interconnected. And when we're looking at, you know, our infrastructure in terms of our water, we could go days, I do these weird diets where, you know, I might go 30 days without eating or whatever. But you can't go without water, you know. We're made of 70% water. The earth is 70% water. And, you know, water is life. And water is a human right. And it's actually declared a human right by the United Nations, whatever we think about United Nations, Bill of Human Rights. And with that, you know, um, uh, Rashida Tlaib, who is a congresswoman, for the state of Michigan, currently also has a bill, and that's the uh, uh, right Human Right to Water Act, and that's currently on the table. And so, as we're throwing down with mutual aid and helping one another, and re, 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 you know reallocating these resources and balancing out this power, we've also got to look at all the places where we have power and where we have people that, you know, that need to be accountable to us, but also where we have people who, are, who have things that, you know, where they're working to be accountable to us. And so um, I'd say, you know, just looking at, at, at all of this, we need to have it, uh, water declared a human right because the folks that are on the right, their argument is that water is not a human right. And that's why they're charging money for water, right? Water should be free. Let's just start there. But while they're commodifying it, it should at least be affordable. And it should be clean. And everyone should have access to it. And there shouldn't be barriers. So, so I just want to throw that in there because um, there's different ways to have power. And some people say, you know, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to throw down. That's some real time stuff that folks could throw down on is those two bills. I'm going to name them again. I think it's the uh, 
the right to the Human Right to Water Act. That's a federal one that Rashida Tlaib has um, and that she's putting forth to Congress. We need folks to get down with that and push that. And also in Detroit, uh, we, the people of Detroit, has a Water Affordability Act. And it's not just for Detroit, right? It's not just for Detroit. It, it's, it's, it's for folks across the state of Michigan. And we're also pushing that nationally, but it's being led in Detroit. And let's, be, let's understand that they're already doing it in Philly. They're already doing it in places in New Jersey, right? There's already places where folks are, you know, making water affordability, you know, a part of legislation. So as we're, um, I'm gonna just close here, but I just wanted to name that as we're struggling to figure out what we can do, we can always throw down on supporting some policy, right? And, 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 and that happens, you know, this year in November, if folks really wanna get, you know, if you wanna be really radical, then, you know, in November, those are things that need to be supported as well as continuing to reach out to one another because that's something that we we can always do as well. We can always just check on people, you know, go next door. You could stay six to 20 feet, but just yell through the window and ask somebody how they're doing and if they're okay and do they need anything. That's a radical concept is just getting back into our humanity and checking on folks. And for white folks who are wondering, you know, I've had ever since the whole, um, all the protests and the uprisings have happened, I've had so many white folks and, you know, just contact me and ask me how I'm doing and what, what they could do. What you could do is if you work somewhere or you know someone that's a black person, that's a different class than you, reach out to that person and ask them how they're doing and ask them what they need. And think about, you know, the, uh, the power that you might hold, you know, or may have been, may have had and not really understand like what you could do with that. You know, it's time for folks to start sharing some of that power. And some of that power could even look like making recommendations for folks because folks need to be supported, you know, helping to whisper into folks' ear about job openings, help them with their, you know, their profiles, because a lot of people are going to be looking for employment, help them to be able to, you know, be propped up properly so that they can sustain themselves. Because the main thing that we want to do is we want people to be able to sustain themselves. We want people, but sometimes people need a little bit of help. Sometimes people need that recommendation. And sometimes we're not in those same social groups for folks to consider people for, you know, to, 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 to be, to have um, access to jobs and things like that. So those are, as we're thinking about mutual aid, you know, I'm a, I'm a proponent of reparations. So if you ever see that word anywhere, you know, um, click yes. And uh, make sure that, that that's something that's a reality and something that gets to happen because we need to redistribute some of this power. So just wanted to kind of end with that. And that's, that's me speaking into the future, you know, some tangible stuff that folks can hop in on right now. Love it, Piper. Um, Angela, did you want to say anything about the future? Sure. Um, <clears throat> one thing that I thought about from the beginning and, and to the beginning of when we started as a collective and throughout and then after is um, a little bit touching on kind of what Piper was saying about our network of our collective, like this group of people that were coordinators, if you will. But then the network of the people who were actually um, who are in need of the aid. So like just kind of how are we connecting in the storytelling form was very important to me is sharing the story and like really, um, you know, staying connected and being able to to use the network properly. And so that's kind of where my mind is, is how are we um, engaging? and sharing the story within and the right story that gets, you know what I mean? Like our story um, from what we're doing. And, and, and I feel like that's kind of where my mind is as well as um, 
you know, it's interesting, like, how, how are we going to gather? Everybody wants, like, how can we get together? Um, it's still really uh, weird, you know, we're still like, I still don't feel comfortable to get in, to go into large spaces, but I also know how important it is at this time now. So it's just one of those weird things that my, that's where my mind is, is how are we sharing our story and how are we staying connected? Um, and uh, I guess, you know, like we put together a WhatsApp group and I think that now, um, you know, during the summer as people uh, like the 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 mutual aid it's it's hasn't gone away it's only going to build and get stronger um but yeah so i guess my my brain is like how do we stay together and how do we continue to to connect and share our story um so if there are any thoughts on that that's kind of where i want to like you know continue how to share because i think that's 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 what for me that's what um that's what drives me as sharing stories, sharing great stories, sharing um, great music, things that lift the spirit um, that, that, you know, everybody has what drives them. And I feel like we connecting through stories is so important. So um, I feel like that we can do a lot with that. So I don't know, those are just a couple of things. I, I will stay connected with our group and I would love to continue to connect statewide. I think it's just so beautiful to be able to, you know, put our hand out and, and like connect and hold each other and uh, be far away, but still so close. So thanks for um, having, you know, this and putting it together. And I, it's just, it's, it's so important. It's, it's powerful. Connection is great. And um, I'll just leave with that. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. Um, I had a couple things to say, but you all said um, such powerful things. Thank you. Um, I want to riff off a couple things that Piper said um, as far as people getting involved that um, maybe haven't been yet or aren't sure how to tap in and um, yeah, don't yet identify as an activist. Um, and think that that's something other than going to talk to your neighbor. It's just um, so well put, Piper. Um, what I noticed in a, in a lot of mutual aid networks that are new, a lot of them are um, a bunch of white people who have never done that work before, and some of whom created networks and didn't reach out to who had already been doing the work. Um, so just doubling down on checking in with leaders in your communities, um, black people, indigenous people, queer people, basically anybody who has been marginalized and or ostracized is now a person who tries to help. Um, generally that's the case. So just make sure to not create new things that, um, aren't in right relationship to what's already been going down for a long time. Um, and uh, another thing that you said, Piper, about funding, um, and uh, Rachel alluded to it as well, like if we can change the way in which people of means think about what um, charity and uh, donating means and, and shifting a little bit, um, for some people, the, the reparations concept is still a little hard to wrap their minds around. Um, but if like as a toe in the water option is to um, just give freely. And that's uh, one of the tenets of mutual aid is so many times in our funding structures, especially with nonprofits and once it becomes um, institutionalized, the all the grant funding has specific requirements of reporting or implementation or the way in which they're supposed to give those funds um and so figuring out ways to decolonize wealth is a an amazing book by edgar villanueva um, that i recommend anybody check out if they're thinking about where and how to put their money and and how to um participate freely so yeah people with money there are some options for you um, and to 
totally about job networks and helping train people and um, refer people. That's key. Um, and uh, the most beautiful thing that uh, I have experienced from participating in mutual aid and is this um, cultivating hope and, and operating from hope. There's that book, uh, Active Hope, I started it, I didn't finish it, so I don't know if I'm recommending it at this moment, but um, Piper, I think your phrase was getting back to your humanity. Um, and Angela, you're talking about that too, like what inspires you? What is gonna motivate you and bring that energy into um, dreaming and creating where we're headed, you know? So yeah, definitely bringing it down into oneself and um, decolonizing one's self and then working with your community and just building it back out. And um, thanks Piper for bringing it back into, um, there are ways to participate in our legal system um, and we should definitely do that. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything else to add or anything that um, you had wanted to share coming into this or that um, you can think of either other mutual aid groups who listen to this or other people who um, aren't involved yet. Any other like last closing things to share? Um, something that just came that came to my mind is that like the young people that are in these families uh, you know, and our families and everyone that's connecting, um, but in the mutual aid, like something that hit to me and that still is strong is like the power with the young people and the education and just like, they're so powerful. They're, they're amazing. But like, um, one of our, one of our coordinators, um, the main one, she was, uh, her family was helped when she was a young person, um, through some sort of organize something but that stuck to her and now she you know took that and she became like the leader of our group um of our collective and she's you know running for office and she's just you know started off in a space where her family needed help and um she will always remember that but she, you know as a leader she saw that people help each other and i just want to like touch on that is that you never know who is um you know, they might not even say anything to you. It might be five years later down the line, but there are a lot of young people who are, in, they are um, powerful and they are stepping into their power um, right now. Um, and, and it's just really, it's really cool and, and happy to watch. I think that's where my, I also play a role in like just kind of, um, you know, helping that next generation step into their power, full uh, power and just, you know, do their thing and, 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 and support that as much as possible, but always, you know, remembering that they are um, awesome and they, they have, you know, huge, oof, that's inspiring. So anyway, I just wanted to, t t to say that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. You're so beautiful. I wanted to, to touch on something, May, um, and kind of going back to, to what you talked about in the context of where, how we move forward and do this work. And, and again, Piper's power sharing, um, which in itself is a form of mutual aid, right? Um, you mentioned um, decolonizing as, as part of that effort. I think that's, that's a great thing to bring up. A lot of people out there, especially, um, you know, potential donors don't know what that is. They really don't. And, but, and then decolonizing means different things for different people. So, you know, decolonization doesn't mean the same thing for the black community as it does for the white community, nor does it mean the same thing for the native community, you know? So the um, so that's something we we all work on together. What does that look like for us? We come from di those different perspectives. Um, you know, as an indigenous person who is actually mixed. You know, I'm I'm both European and ind indigenous. So how do I look at that framework in the context of indigenous mutual aid? And I agree. It's you know, for me the um, 
I, I, I had just posted something the other day that kind of spoke to this for me, and I wanted to share that because in the context of what we're doing, it kind of goes to this under basis of why we're doing it. And um, I always say I'm not trying to raise like a, a decolonized family because um, I'm technically not colonized, right? I mean, there's part of me that came as part of a colony, but my people have always been here. So we're, we're not a colony right? We, we've been um, oppressed by colonists. So, but I rejected that we're colonized. <laughs> we've been survivors. So what I, what I always like to say is I'm not trying to decolonize my family. I'm trying to um, raise a system, a kinship system that's grounded in indigenous love, right? But we all come from systems of love and they all mean something. They all mean something. So when we talk about that concept in indigenous mutual aid or in mutual aid, um, I like to look at that as, as really the reason for being and the basis of who we are and what we're doing. So are we, it, it goes beyond decolonizing, it goes into creating a system of love and kinship. And that's what we're doing, we're making relatives. And my way we'd say, you know, mutual aid is a huge ceremony we're clan making, we're, we're um, family making, and, and recognizing the sacred in each other and, and all of us, um, that we're valuable people, we're valuable spirits on the planet, we're, we're, um, we're all part of this together. And so um, I wanted to offer that because I, I really enjoyed hearing what everybody had to say. And Piper, you and I have to talk because, you know, we, I, my hairs were getting all up here because she was getting my water protector stuff going you know all my standing rock fervor <laughs> and my years and years of you know but, uh, but um the uh I, I really enjoyed hearing that and I just wanted to make that point um which you know makes me doubly glad to be doing this work so moving forward you know as tired as we are and as busy as we are I like to remind um ourselves that it's based in love and it's based in making family and now you know technically since you're on our land indigenous kinship yeah <laughs> i don't have anything else to say piper did you want to close it out do you, have, you got any last words um well i definitely just want to um, I know we said it before, but I definitely want to uplift um, having the brilliance of a person like um, Angela on your team to help figure out how to how all this works. That is really, really, really key because it's one thing to say you want to help people, and if you don't have that, some you might be causing harm. So um, just want to uplift the, the, the need to, you know, either get with a mutual aid system that's already going and support that. That's a, that's a, you know, maybe start there. But if you're feeling like you're really compelled, that you really just got to do it yourself wherever you are, definitely make sure you've got either you are that person or make sure you've got that person that's like Angela that just really think through the specific steps of like, how is this going to work? Because that really, really, really gave us a lot of power. It gave us a lot of momentum. It allowed us to work together better. And like, that's really the point of mutual aid is that you're working together, together better. So yeah, just want us to, I just want to leave that as like a final note and then um, just want to give a lot of honor and gratitude to everyone that poured into this just now. A um, lot of honor and gratitude to all of our ancestors that brought us to this moment. Um, just honor and gratitude to all the brilliance and care of everyone that's involved in doing mutual aid and taking care of one another and um, want to send lots of protection to folks who really need um, 
to be protected and to be loved and to be cared on and to be poured into at this moment that are that that really need the services and resources that mutual aid is providing and also just want to send into the ethers that we are winning we're seeing wins happen as we speak and just want to honor the wins that that we that we're experiencing and want to send more energy and more light to the places in which we're able to make transformation and want to say that another world is happening as at this very moment and it's because of everyone that's involved so just want to send lots of honor gratitude to all our ancestors for making this moment happen we are your tears we are your dreams and want to send forth to all the young people that that are involved in the uprisings want to send lots of protection you know and then the very last want to send to the unborn to all our unborn that are yet to come into this world we're working to make it better for you and you're making it better as you're on your way there's lots of people who are on their way to this earth right now so we just want to uh say we're grateful to you we are led by you and we're just very honored and and grateful so i i could put a period there if that's okay Peace, everyone.